morning, David. So, you know, welcome to episode two, season one of Speak Easy with Haroon, where we talk with artists, creatives and troublemakers. And I've got a feeling from having read your bio that you probably tick all three of those boxes, potentially. <laughs> so, yeah, first and foremost, um, how are you today? And uh, how was your weekend, given just the absolute plethora of... Um, uh, different sporting events that were going on and the carnage that probably ensued. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm kind of, um, I think most people would expect from my accent, I was hoping England were going to lose, but I actually really like the team. You know, I think Southgate's a good manager. Um, uh, I really feel for Marcus Rash Rashford. And I think most people do, actually, even people that don't support England because he's just such a great, you know, he's done so many positive things and also stepped up. You know, that's the other thing I think we're forgetting in this discussion is that those players that missed, you know, they had the balls to, you know, take those penalty kicks. And, you know, needless to say that, you know, there's a certain element we have in society um, that are going to are going to give them a hard time about it. But um, but yeah, yeah, it was a good um, it was a good weekend. It was a good weekend. Good, good. So look, um, just. For those who don't know, do you want to give like just a little quick 30 to 60 minute intro and then we can you know, just get into basically your history and your journey of how you got to where you are and, um, you know, the trial yeah. nations and just some of your motivations for doing what you do. Yeah. So, um, so let's see, I've been a write, I've been writing probably since I was about, um, about 16, uh, 15, 16. How many years, uh, David? How many years does that make it? Oh God, I was I was just uh, the reason I paused is I was trying to do the math here. Well, let's see, I'm 52, I'm 52 tomorrow. So so people can people can um, people can work that out. It's too early to figure that out. But um, I think that makes it 36 years. Yeah, up there. Yeah, certainly up there. And probably making a living at it um for about 22 of those years. So I started out in, um, in terms of paid writing work, I started out in TV um, and I wrote for some of the shows that people would recognise the UK would be Brookside. Uh, I wrote three seasons of Biker Grove, little other bits and pieces, did an original pilot for ITV that never went to series. Um, and then got sick of TV, um, and wrote a thriller and uh, published under the name Sean Black. And I guess we can talk about where that came from in a, a little bit later. And um, that's the Ryan Locke series of thrillers. And so I've written, I just published this year, I wrote the 12th um, book in that series. And I think, I don't know, I've written some of like 18 novels, um, you know, so that's kind of, that's kind of how I, uh, that's kind of how I pay the bills. So kind of, professional screenwriter slash novelist since the age of about uh, 30. Okay, that's really, really impressive. And I think for me, um, you know, we we met on something called the London Writers Salon, where, you know, we turned up every day and we wrote, and I think we bonded. And, you know, we've had a few conversations sort of prior to this. And I think what I find quite interesting, I'd like to know a little bit more about your background, just growing up in Scotland. Um, and how, if at all, that basically influenced your choice of being a writer or what you write about and how you approach your career? Yeah, so I, I mean, so I was kind of, um, I, was, I was very fortunate in many ways um, that I grew up uh, in a house with a lot of books, you know? And so I grew up um, also in quite a kind of political household. My uh, dad, was a really interesting guy. He left school at 14 um, to work as a labourer. He was from a pretty, you know, solidly working class family in central Scotland. And it was, you know, he was from that generation where, um, you know, you had to bring in a wage, you know. You know, it was like, you know, after the Second World War, so he left school at 14, became a labourer and ended up as a, a reader in history at Stirling University and specialised in... Um, in labour history, kind of working class uh, history, was very involved with politics. 
Um, so I always kind of grew up around um, kind of in a, in a kind of intellectual family, you know, albeit with, you know, very kind of working class roots. Um, and so I guess the f I probably got into writing because I had quite a romantic notion of writers. And so I guess around my teenage years, I would be reading people like James Baldwin, who, you know, has come into back into vogue with Black Lives Matter. Although I'm always shocked, just as a to slightly digress, I'm always shocked how people throw, especially people that are attacking Black Lives Matter, they should go back and look at the speech he gave. I think it was at the Oxford Union, it might have been the Cambridge Union, uh, where I think it was one of the first times he talked about that phrase. I think you can find it on YouTube. And um, he's, he's talking about really what racism is. Um, so anyway, so I, yeah, so I, so I grew up kind of reading people like him, you know, James Jones from Here to Eternity, you know, Norman Mailer, Hemingway, and also alongside of that, a lot of the kind of, um, at the time, contemporary Scottish writers uh, like James Kelman, who won uh, the Booker Prize a few years ago, Alistair Gray, and I think growing up in Scotland in the 1980s, um, you know, with, with kind of Thatcherism running rampant, um, it was actually a very, culturally, it was a very, um, it was a really very interesting time. If you, you know, there was a lot of books, there was a lot of music, there was a lot of poetry, and it kind of crossed over with that kind of political engagement. Um, so that was, so that was, that was kind of one part of my, um, childhood and then the other part of my childhood was uh, I was born with a congenital birth deformity so I had a club foot I had a, a bone missing in my leg I had a shortened bone and um, so I, I kind of grew up having to deal with that and then I had my leg amputated um, above the knee when I was 17 um, so those were the kind of those were the kind of two dual things and then in terms of the, the other part of my upbringing, in terms of education, because my dad was really left wing, there was no way we were getting sent to a private school. So I went to the local comprehensive, um, which was, you know, which was pretty rough at the time. Um, and that may explain why I've tended to, I've spent a lot of time uh, writing about kind of very masculine environments and writing about violence. Um, so those are those are kind of some of the some of the kind of main streams, and then I just had this, you know, when I when I was in university, um, you know, a lot of people were uh, graduating and going off to be management consultants, and I just really did not fancy that at all, um, and uh, decided that I wanted to be a writer, but it was really, but I had a really kind of um, I had a really romantic notion of what of what writing is. Um, you know, if, if I'd known what it involved, you know, would have I pursued it? Yeah, probably. Um, but I probably would have done things, approached things a little bit differently um, with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, but I kind of, you know, I got there, you know, I kind of got there in the end. And I think for writers, I mean, I really think, you know, it is a bit of the old cliche, but I think most of it is just about turning up and doing the work. You know, and until you're good, you're really not good. Um, but you have to kind of, you know, work your way through all that stuff to kind of to get to a point, um, you know, where your work's at a certain level and, and hopefully you can hopefully you can make a living from it. OK, so I think there's a couple of things I've touched upon and we'll work through them sequentially. Firstly, you said that um, if you knew then what you knew now, that you'd approach it differently. How would you approach it differently? What is it that you know now that contrasts with, you know, your more sort of romantic notion of what a writer is and how you go about, you know, and I use this word quite uh, particularly, the business of writing? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think the big thing looking back on my 20s and, and I, I just see a lot of this with people who are writing, you know, either people just starting out when they're younger or people who are coming into it a little bit later is that there's a lot of focus on things like agents, or that's literary agents or film agents, you know, getting meetings, you know, because you're, because you're, I think because at that stage, and, and this doesn't change, you know, you're seeking validation. 
And really, uh, the one thing I would change is I would have written a lot more. You know, even when, you know, I ended up going to uh, film school after my undergrad. And, and probably in my, in, you know, in my year at film school, I was regarded as, you know, you know, kind of fairly prolific. But prolific was maybe one feature screenplay a year. I mean, if I go, if I went back now, I'd be doing like two or three. You know, just like just like running through it, that's probably one thing I would change. And then the other thing I would change, um, and, and one of the things that kind of changed my, really changed my career big time, uh, was going off and doing research. You know, like going off and doing real world research, rather than just relying on trying to conjure things from your own experience and your own mind and from you know watching other TV shows or or reading books. Um, having said that, you know I think I think a lot of the one of the things you have to have, whether it's music or writing or or dance or poetry or any of the creative arts, I think it's no bad thing to be a little bit naive, you know, because if if you knew what the odds were like, you wouldn't you'd probably go and do something else with your life. And also if you knew just the amount of, um, just the amount of rejection um, you have to deal with. And the thing I would say about that is that doesn't change, you know, like, like not every project works and, and also not every, especially, you know, when you're publishing and you're getting, you're stacking up those reviews on Goodreads and Amazon and then, um, what what that does for you is is you really have to acquire quite a kind of quite a kind of thick skin. But yeah, I would say the number one thing is um, is focus on the work. Okay. If you focus on the work, everything else will take care of itself. So this really ties into the second thing that I wanted to touch upon, um, which was you were saying that look, you have to keep turning up. Um, and working your way through getting good because you're not. So can you talk a little bit more about just that arc of starting off not being good and getting good and what what does it take to potentially get good? I think I think it's two things. I think one is just one one is turning up doing the work and writing. And then the other thing, and this is really difficult, is is filtering feedback. You know, so so getting feedback on your work and then being able to take that feedback and, um, and decide what's good, useful, actionable feedback and what's not. Because, I mean, a big problem with screenwriting and, and, and writing books is there's, there's a load of people that will tell you how to do it. But a lot of the advice actually doesn't practically help you. You know, I think if you read a lot of screenwriting books or, or books about writing novels or just, just narrative, books about creating narrative, whether that's, whether that's um, you know, fiction or non-fiction narrative, um, you know, one of, the, one of the big problems with that is that, is that people arrive at analysis and an analysis after. You know, they look at someone and say, well, it was, you know, on page 61, you know, you know, this is the first turn and whatever it is, you know, page 24 on a screenplay, page 25 on a screenplay. And very often, I think working writers are not necessarily sitting down doing that consciously. Um, I mean, I think the most, you know, the most basic advice, you know, tends to be the best, which is, you know, obviously you have to have conflict, whether that's internal or external conflict. If you're writing a scene or a chapter in a book, something has to happen to move the story along. It doesn't necessarily have to be something big. Um, but again, that's that's all stuff you learn just from experience, you know? And probably the best, the thing that really helped me, although I found it kind of quite um, difficult and painful at the time, was getting on my first TV show. So getting on Brookside, because you were constantly, um, you were constantly working. You know, if you were commissioned, you were writing a first draft and you might be doing 
second draft and third draft notes on other scripts. You were constantly getting feedback. And also you were in a situation where you were being given an episode to write with storylines. And very often you would get an episode to write and you would think, I have no idea how I get 25 minutes of television out of this. You know, this is... Were they giving you something that was almost paper thin? Well, so, I mean, some, I mean, you know, because the way the way we're working soaps, and I think soaps was a great training ground, and it's no coincidence that a lot of the bigger TV writers in the UK came from those types of shows. Um, so the way it works in soaps is you cut, you know, your say it's on a mo Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. Every episode is ending with a hook to get people to come back for the following episode. And usually you're trying to build your story. So the Friday hook, the hook on a Friday night is the biggest one of the week. And, and by, you know, by dint of just how it works, the fact that they're churning out, you know, 150, 200 episodes of TV every year, you know, sometimes you're going to get episodes where really you're just planting the seeds for, you know, a bigger storyline. You know, it's not like the American shows or, or the kind of Netflix model where you might have 12 episodes or 24 episodes where you can really, you can jam a lot of story in, you know, and you can keep things moving. There, you know, you can't run, you know, you can't run. I mean, what might be a story that would take one episode and, you know, in a, in a big US drama, you know, they're going to they're gonna try and kick the arse out of it and get, you know, four weeks, six weeks, you know, maybe a couple of months out of it. So the pacing tends to be a little bit slower. So that that was a good kind of proving ground because, so, so, yeah, a lot of times you would get you would get stories or you would get scenes where you were like, I, I don't know what the conflict is in this scene because you're just setting, you know, you know, someone has to go buy and buy tea bags because you know, that's going to pay off on Friday. Um, so, so I think what that really, you know, what that really gave me was just that ability to, um, to, to look at a piece of story and try and try and generate some kind of drama uh, from it. And then obviously the other thing that teaches you is there, you know, is the real basic stuff about, and this doesn't change between books and screenplays for me. Just that thing about where, you know, where you start the scene. You know, you can, you know, because there's there's really hundreds of entry points at the most scenes. And that's one of the big, you know, that's one of the big decisions where, you, where you're going to start that scene and then where you come out of that scene and how that then throws to your next scene. But if you're, if you're doing, um, you know, if you're under the gun, and you're just having to continually generate material. Um, I mean, it can give you bad habits as well. It's not all. It's not all great, um, but you're gonna get better. You know, you're gonna get better. Um, and it's difficult when you're just when you're starting out because you don't have that gun to your head. You know, you do because they don't. You know, you can't miss deadlines on those shows. You know, I mean, I had all sorts of medical emergencies and things that happened in life. And uh, you might get a couple of extra days. Um, but, you know, that, you know, if you don't produce, then that script is going to be taken off you and given to someone else. And, you know, you're not going to get paid for it. So I suppose in that way, it's, um, it's probably similar to journalism. And the journalists tend to, if, if they can make the transition, which not all of them can, but if they can make the transition, they tend to have that kind of work ethic, that kind of cranking it through. And, and finally on that, I mean, I would say that uh, I found, we should definitely give them a plug, um, London Writers Salon. I found that, um, doing that phenomenal for getting your work done. Just this idea for, for people aren't familiar with it, London Writers Salon essentially run, they do a lot of stuff. A lot of great stuff, but uh, they run kind of communal Zoom calls, three or four, three or four a day, Monday to Friday, and you, you come into this big Zoom room with hundreds of people, and you kind of, you know, you write down or you type in the chat what you're going to work on, and then there's usually some kind of quote, inspirational quote, or something to quote about writing, 
and then uh, you go on silent for 40 minutes and then you know people can say how much they got done at the end and usually a couple of people talk about what they're working on and uh, I think things like that are are really helpful you know I don't think I don't think every writer needs to write every day you know people are different some people write in great big bursts and, and then won't work for a couple of weeks um, but yeah you've kind of you've got to kind of You've got to keep at it. You know, it's, it's the only, like, going to seminars about writing, talking about writing, it's all great, but, you know, that's not how you learn how to do it. You learn how, you know, you, you, you learn to write by writing and then, you know, putting stuff away and coming back to it and seeing what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, and if you focus on that consistently, um, I think, you know, most people will get there. You know, I, I mean, the only reason I managed to have a career is, um, is just because, I, you know, I had a little bit of talent, but I'm by no means the most talented writer out there. I mean, not even close. Um, but, you know, natural talent is, is, to my mind, is vastly overrated. It's, it's what you do with it. It's about putting in the work. Uh, I, I'm inclined to agree on that. I think. Have you heard of a writer called Jeff Goins? No, no. Tell me. So he he wrote a book um, several years ago called "Real Artists Don't Start." And what they basically ended up doing was, um, I think, as just part of research with some other colleagues of his, they did some digging around of like bank records for uh, Michelangelo. And it turned out Michelangelo actually was filthy rich. <laughs> Not only was he filthy rich, I think he charged multiples of what even Leonardo da Vinci would charge. And in that entire book, what Jeff Goins is basically trying to do is he's saying that actually this whole myth of the starving artist is a very dangerous, perversely romanticized ideal. And that actually, if you're an artist, you should work on getting paid. Now, what lies underneath that is that Jeff Goins has a very particular attitude towards writing, because that's his art form, but it could pertain to painting or whatever, which is he views writing as manual labor. Mm, yeah. He, I mean, he, I mean, he very strictly is the proponent. He's a bit more inflexible on this compared to what, what you were. But he said that, look, you turn up every day, and you know, just do 500 words every day. There's no way you can't get something done or get better. And he says it, he, he literally says every day, you know, you put your overalls on and you punch your time card and you do your shift, you write. Mm. Because what, what I've found personally is there's a lot of writers who tend to, you know, they, they very much romanticize, like, oh, I only do stuff when inspiration hits. And actually, if you were to sort of, you know, run a log of just how much they write, yeah, it's not a lot. You know, I, do... yeah, I, I mean, there's, I mean there's, a, there's a couple of things in there. Um, I was going to say I'm a big believer, but it's not even, you don't have to believe it. I mean, it's just, it's just true. You know, the creative subconscious or the, the creative unconscious um, is a very real thing. You know, if you, I can't tell you how many times if I'm stuck on, if I was stuck working on a script or I'm stuck on a book, if, if I think about it, if I think, okay, right, I don't know where the story goes. I don't know what I'm going to write next or whatever it is. And if you go to bed and you sleep, and you get up the next morning and you start writing, it's there. The salute, like that, like that part of your brain will, will take care of it. But, but you can only tap into that if you actually sit down and write. Oh, because, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, from, I mean, the goat was starting to sort of move on to myself, but, um, you know, my own background is as someone who late teens, the early 20s, wanted to be a writer. I used to write raps in my late teens, then my early 20s was you know, student journalism and poetry. And 
for a whole plethora of like mental health reasons. I had undiagnosed autism and ADHD, which only just got diagnosed in the last year. But, you know, for those reasons and some that were probably a lack of self-belief and, you know, coming from a cultural and family background where there was no other examples of people who did creative things, I went off in a completely different direction. I didn't write from age sort of 23, 24 till about when I filed for divorce, just as I was turning 36. And for the longest time, I used to keep saying, oh, I didn't write for all these years. But actually, I believe that that assertion is incorrect because that whole time, my creative subconscious was working. I was writing. All that's changed, I think, you know, later on in life is that I just turn up to tap into that creative subconscious. And that's something which, um, are you familiar with the writer Stephen Pressfield? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who I think is a great, anyone who's a writer should be reading his work because I think he takes it to another level beyond Jeff Goins where he talks about concepts like resistance, where, you know, you don't feel like doing something, but really you've got to push against it. If you want to do something like write or play an instrument, a lot of times you've got to do it when you don't feel like doing it. And um, there's something I believe in strongly, which he says, which is um, the muse, or, you know, we can call it the creative subconscious, it's probably there with all of us, but it only, pr it only prolifically and profusely rewards those who actually turn up and honour it, which is by, you know, getting to the page and actually writing. And I think that's been one of the great things of the London Writers Salon. And I think let's give a shout out to Matt and Parrell, who are the founders of it. I think basically it was some kind of in-person writing community to begin with, because I saw that and I was like, no, I haven't had a chance to go and see it. And then when the pandemic hit um, last year with COVID-19, I think like a lot of very smart and nimble people, they pivoted instead of throwing their hands up and going, oh, what are we gonna do? We can't do this thing that we've done in person. It turned to Zoom and I think they started it around February or March. And I joined about, I don't know when you joined, I joined about a month in. Um, yeah, I joined a little bit later. Yeah. But I, I remember we would join and there was only one, one session a day. It was like um, 8 a.m. London time. And um, at most 40, 50 people would turn up. I think now, you know, it's several hundred. Like it's, you know, the minimum, even on a slow session is 150, but really it can hit 200, 250. And it's not just that, they run one on Eastern time, so New York, one on Pacific time for sort of LA. Um, and they've started running one on, I think, New Zealand time. So there's like four instances in a day. So if you, those of us who are listening in the UK, that's like 8 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and then I think 9 p.m. Um, and yeah, I think like yourself, I found myself writing way more. And I think it's like a drug because um, I found myself joining other writers groups as well. So I do a free write every Tuesday on Clubhouse with some people. It's like a five minute free write with a prompt. But also I find myself jumping in in other workshops and so forth. So yeah, I think the London Writers Salon is a great example of, you know, the, the great things that happen when you turn up. And I think, you know, we can see that we're not the only ones who've benefited. I think there's been, and there continue to be a lot of people who are growing in their, you know, in their um, abilities as writers. Because like you said, I think talent is overrated. And I think and this is something I want to touch upon, whether it's certain types of parents or whether it's teachers, I feel like there's a lot of people who could be really good at something who get ruined by being, they get fawned over for their natural ability and talent. Yeah. As opposed to, yeah. you know, just being told like, look, turn up and just do this just keep doing it it's very it may be boring it may be unsexy but if you just keep turning up you'll get good at it i don't think we have enough of that sort of narrative and do you think there's anything that could be done i don't know within education or within just the culture or parenting that could sort of counter that you know slightly damaging narrative that i think a lot of us have grown up with yeah i, I mean i mean one of the things i was going to say uh just a kind of um, when I was when I was doing when I was doing TV and I was doing Brookside, the average amount of time 
or, or let's say that not the, not the meeting, the median amount of time, the most common amount of time it took people to get in that room to be paid writers. A lot of people came from, you know, theatre and things like that. It was probably about 10 years. Um, and I lived, I lived out in LA for a year after film school. And I had a, I had a friend who was um, actually was best man when I got married. And his uh, mum uh, was a woman called Joanna Ray, who was, I think she's retired now, but she was one of the biggest casting directors in Hollywood. She cast Tarantino's movies, uh, Jane Campion's movies. Hugely influential, talented woman. And, and um, you know, I was doing screenwriting at the time and trying to break in. And she actually said to me, and this always really stuck with me, and it was the same 10-year time span. She said, you know, in this time, 10 years is overnight success. And I think one of the problems we run into, we run into culturally is we love this idea of the overnight success. And it's complete bullshit. It's just total... I'll try not to swear. <laughs> it's no, just you can, you can nonsense. Be, you can use whatever like It's total nonsense. Um, it just, it just it doesn't exist, man. It just doesn't exist. And, 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 and occasionally when you, you'll find, I've run across people from time to time, you'll find people who, you know, they get success before they're really ready for it. You know, the first thing they write or they go in and pitch someone and it goes to series. And a lot of times those people's careers are over before they start. Um, you know, it, it, you just, you have to kind of, you just have to keep at it. But to go back to your original question in terms of um, in terms of you know parenting and, and all the rest of it, I mean there's two things because obviously you've told me a little bit about your background and, and your journey. And one thing is people have good people tend to have a very kind of weird idea about how you can make money, you know, especially in the world we live in. So I was uh, before we started the call. I was saying I watched um, I watched the UFC in, uh, event in Las Vegas where Conor McGregor was fighting over the weekend, and uh, I was saying to my wife on the on the Sunday, "Isn't it a strange thing that two men getting in a cage probably generated half a billion dollars of economic activity?" And it's exactly the same with cultural products. I mean, I don't like the term product, but you know, if we use that as a catch-all, whether it's books, whether it's music, whether it's design, whether it's art, whether it's painting, whether it's sculpture, we, we're brought up with this idea that, as you said, it's all airy-fairy, it's all very amorphous, but there's huge economies you know, attached to these things. Well, it actually it, generate, it, generate, it generates more money than football. Yeah, yeah, and yet, and yet, it's it's not given, it's not given the support, and it's not given the resources, and that goes back to schools. You know the fact. I mean, if you know most people, um, you know, if most people say to their, um, you know, say to their parents or their teachers, oh, "I want to be a writer or a painter," you know, they're going to get well, you know, you know, get a trade if they're working class, or or maybe go be a lawyer and 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 do it on the side. And it's not seen. It's not seen as a viable economic thing. When I think, particularly at the moment, it absolutely is. I mean, the one, the one thing I had going for me, and I think it was, this was partly, I suspect, um, connected to my disability, was I had a real problem with people telling me I couldn't do something. Like my attitude to that. If someone told me I can't do something, my attitude to that was "fuck you, man." Like, thank you, you know, all day long and twice on Sundays. And yet, and I think that's that stood me in good stead with writing because you're gonna have you're gonna have a lot of rejection. You're gonna have a huge amount of rejection. And also, especially in especially in TV, publishing slightly a little bit more genteel. I mean, you you know, you're gonna have people say horrible things to you. <laughs> TV I, I can attest and about your work. because after university as part of my wanting to break into like film and tv at that time um i actually worked as a runner in a post-production studio and i've never been spoken to in my life 
over even basic things like making a cup of tea and making someone a sandwich, like you have to be very thick skinned. You have to be incredibly thick skinned in, you know, the sort of media side of things, even vis-a-vis -vis sort of publishing where, like you said, people can be uh, at least relatively uh, gentle and kind, gentler and kinder. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm really glad that, uh, I mean, and most of these things are coming up are, are related to sexual harassment. And I think it's absolutely, but it's it spread into a discussion of bullying as well. Um, I mean, when I worked on TV in the UK, you know, being a little bit older and, you know, not needing the, you know, I needed the money then. And, and, and you know, and that's the, that's the, so there was, a, you know, so I accepted a lot of things now that, I, you know, I wouldn't accept. Um but but I think those discussions that we're having that have kind of sprung from sprung from the Me Too movement, they're they're discussions that are way overdue, way well, overdue, massively, massively. Because I think one of the things that's been fascinating now is I talked to a friend who he's a scriptwriter. He's done some internships at the BBC. He's now you know like a lot of us you know got a job or a day job that's paying his bills, but he's writing every hour God sends. And the conversations I hear now, and you know, I'm 40 now, but he's sort of 30. But even now the conversations I hear are so centered around, I don't rate that person now because they don't have a safe environment on their set, or I would evaluate wanting to work for this person because it's a safe set. So one of the famous ones that we hear about now is Atlanta, Donald Glover's show, where I've heard that generally it's one of the most compassionate sets you can work on. I mean, everyone's making sure that everyone's okay, but at the same time, they don't fuck around. When it's time to work, they work. Mm -hmm. And it's demonstrated just by the quality of the show. It's an incredible show. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting time where yeah, the talk from Me Too is segued into you know, tackling even wider things like just general bullying, um, which hopefully, you know, we can, those conversations can lead to longer lasting change. But in general, still, you know, what you're saying is, is that in something like TV, outside of that, just even professionally, you're going to have, have, have to have a thick skin because there will be constructive criticism. You know, there will be, like you said, um, very short deadlines and you've just got to get things done. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that helped me um, was the realisation, and this was more when I started to do, um, you know, when I started to, to publish novels because now you get feedback from everyone you know it used to be like you would get a right up in the daily mail or a telegraph or whatever and you know if it was a bad review you were upset and if it was a good review you know you were happy but now with online you know you get all your amazon reviews and all the rest of it and then um, the, the thing that helped me in that was i uh, one day it occurred to me do i like everything i read or do i like everything i watch and the answer is no you know, there's maybe about 20% of things I read or watch that I really, really enjoy. Yeah. You know, and a smaller percentage. Um, so so why should I be special? You know, why should why should I be different? Why should I be exempt? And also the other thing, when you're publishing, when you're publishing um novels, and, and certainly when you're publishing series, if and I'm, I'm about to start working on a on a new series of thrillers, but one of the things you have to brace yourself for is. When you tend to look at Amazon, if you go on and look at a, a series of books on Amazon, and what you'll tend to find is that the first book will have more negative reviews. And that's simply because lots of people are picking it up who it's just not for them. It's not their thing. And that's absolutely fine. And then usually by book two, it starts to settle down and, and book three, you, you know, you're kind of getting down to your readership and you might, you might draw in new readers for book three or book four and some of whom won't like it, but you kind of, you find your readership, you find your readership. So you realize quite quickly, you know, if not every book and TV show and movie is for me, why would I assume you know the converse that something yeah. I write, everyone's everyone's gonna love. So, and I think that can save you. You know that 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 can save you a lot of grief. But a lot of that is once you, um, you know, once you've had you know five hundred reviews. I mean, I don't know how many I've gotten. Like you'd read on Amazon, you know, probably over ten thousand. You just tune it out, 
um, which is which is a you know sometimes you can learn from feedback and readers' feedback, and it's something that it's something that I do listen to if if I think it's if I think it's constructive. Um, one of the other things I noticed was when I started doing um, translations. And I thought this was kind of this this was quite interesting, and this speaks to something wider about the internet. Um, you know, because we're all, we're all a lot more exposed to things, even if we just have a Twitter account. And you know, and I think until probably the last four or five years, I could be I'll admit I could be quite kind of thin skinned, you know, about about things, um, and that's changed for a couple of reasons. But when I started doing translations of my main series, the Ryan Locke series, uh, the books really started to take off in Italy. And when I was looking at the reviews, because I can't, I don't, I don't understand Italian. So if I got a one star or a two star review, because it was an Italian, because I couldn't understand it, it had no power to upset me. So you're saying the content of the review is something that actually had more of an impact than the star rating? Yeah, absolutely. You know, because, I mean, I used to, um, one of the things that helped me get over when I did the first book, you know, when I was doing readings, I hate reading my own work. You know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm, not, a very, I'm not very good at reading. <laughs> I don't like how I stumble over my words. And, and also, I hate reading my own stuff. You know, by the time I've finished that, I'm, I'm sick of it. Um, so what I used to do at readings, just for a laugh, because I thought it was funny, and it took the sting off it, was I used to read like the, the most uh, obnoxious, rude, one-star reviews from Amazon that I could find. You know, so it would be things like, you know, Sean Black, you know, must write with crayon. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, you know, it's about like, you know, they used to do that thing on the American talk shows about celebrities reading mean tweets. But the funny thing is when you share that stuff, it's just it immediately becomes funny. And it and it and it takes and it takes the it takes the sting off it. Um, you know, so that would be uh, but yeah, but you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get a lot of rejection. And the other thing, the other thing to say about rejection is um, you know, when I when I sold the first book, I sold it at auction. Um, and before that, I was looking for a literary agent. And it sold for a lot of money at auction. There was plenty of agents that turned that book down. You know, there was maybe I queried 20 agents and, you know, 15, 16 had no interest in representing me or that book. And yet that book sold for, you know, mid six figures. Well, you're familiar with the um, TV writer, Brian Koppelman? Yes, yeah, billion writer. Yeah, yeah, billions. So, you know, his first break was um, he did the script, Tim David Levine did the script for Rounders. And he basically says that everyone, everyone in the town, you know, in Hollywood, they all initially passed on it. Mm -hmm. Until someone basically went for it and, you know, it ended up being something that, you know, a movie that had John Malkovich, David Turturro, uh, Matt Damon, uh, you know, a whole slew of like proper A-list, you know, like character actors. Now yeah, he I mean, writes for TV and with Billions, which is, you know, a show that I love greatly. So, yeah. That's a, fan that's a fantastic show. I, I actually have a, I have an even more mind-blowing example of that, which I think I, I think I mentioned to you the last time we spoke, um, which is, I have a friend, someone I met, a good number of years ago, who was a, a TV writer in uh, a TV and screenwriter, more screenplays, kind of movies of the week in LA, um, a guy called David Seidler, and that might give the story away to a few people who are familiar with these things. Um, and he sent me a script again, I can't remember the precise timing, but it was a good number of years ago um, that he'd uh, a feature script that he'd written that I gave to the person that was then representing the uh, film rights to my books. They passed on it. He could not get this. I, and, and it was a script I remember reading and going, this is one of the best things I've ever read. Um, and he had every, I mean, every single studio, every single production company turned it down. The BBC turned it down. You know, you could just like a, a laundry list 
everyone turned this script down. But he had this feeling that he was on to something special. And so he organised a reading of it, just organised some actors and a reading in, in London. And um, the script was the King's Speech. Uh, I, remember, I remember the story now. I had to resist the urge to jump in and go, yeah, oh, to tell you. Um, a bit like everyone, everyone turned that down. And then I had the experience when they were when they were filming it. Can't remember it's Pinewood or Elstree, Street, one of the big studios. Uh, I was going to be over in London anyway, and David said, "Look, do you want to come on set and and spend the day on set?" Um, and I spent the day on set, and then I had to go and meet this agent, who, by the way, this agent's like a really good guy, you know, like he's, you know, like this isn't me having a having a dig at him at all. He's like one of the he's one of the good guys. Uh, you know, the good people in, in, um, in the British TV and film industry. But, you know, I couldn't resist to have, you know, tease him a little bit, you know. So I said, oh, I said, yeah. I won't say his name, but I said, yeah, I was just on the set of, um, you know, I was just, you know, hanging out with Colin Firth <laughs> and Helena Bonham Carter. I said, do you remember? Do you remember that? You know, I sent you that script and uh, you said, you, you know, you couldn't do anything with it. You know, and he laughed, you know, to be fair, he knew, you know, he knew I was teasing him and, and he laughed. And, and those people know as well that they don't get, you know, it's just why it's, it's really easy once something's been a hit to go, oh, it was obvious. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. But, but you see, this is this is. We'll jump into this. Um, I think when something's actually happening and you have to be the one to potentially discover it that's when you find out potentially who the real ones are. For example, I'm gonna draw this analogy to something like history. You know, there's lots of people who look back and go, yeah, yeah, civil rights, Martin Luther King. But those same people seem to just not be able to get behind something like say Black Lives Matter right now. Mm -hmm. And you sort of have to sit there and say, I think if you were there when, you know, they were, you know, when Martin Luther King and his followers were descending upon Selma, I'm not sure you would have backed them the way that you can from the comfort of, you know, your living room chair 50, 60 years or even 70 years after the fact. And so I think it's similar with, there's a particular type of person who can see a piece of work and recognize it, you know, whether it's a script or, you know, a piece of music, you know, and then go, okay, yes, I know, as opposed to people who jump, because I think, unfortunately, a lot of people, once there's some support for something, it's easier for them to jump and sort of, and some of that might just be that it's less risky to sort of, you know, nail their colours to the door and go, yeah, I like that. But also, some of it's just probably there's, there's a skill to recognising something in the moment when it's happening, rather than when someone's actually handed it to you on a platter and said, yes, it's validated this is what you should read, watch, or listen to, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I should say that when I read it, I didn't think, oh, this is going to win the Oscar. <laughs> you no, know, no, but I thought you, it was really good. But, I mean, but no one knows that. I don't think anyone but, knows that. But you knew, but you knew yeah. that it was something that was potentially worth making or pursuing, that he was onto something. Yeah. As opposed to something that wasn't, because, you know. But there, there, was, a, there was another really good, good lesson that came out of that for me, though. Um, and that was, that had been the script that he'd wanted to write for a long time. Um, and I think David's spoken about this. And part of what prompted him, he had a bunch of stuff happening in his personal life. But one of the things was he'd recovered from cancer, you know, before he wrote that script. And, and it was kind of one of those, you know, I might not be around forever. You know, and that's a very, and that's actually, I mean, that's a very powerful thing. And that's a very powerful thing in terms of, um, you know, in terms of decide, in terms of how you do your work, you know, because it's very easy. What I found when I was working in TV is very easy. Someone, um, a friend of mine used to call writing for TV, the velvet coffin. Because, you um, phrase. yeah, because it was very, you know, because you're making, you know, I mean, I was teaching before. So, I mean, I went from, you know, making, you know, maybe 18 grand teaching in the north of England to a situation where I could I could almost make that in a month. Um, but at a certain point, are you not every month, but you could you could make it in a month. Um, but at a certain point, you know, then you bec it becomes like another job. 
you know and certainly i found before i it took it took me really getting fed up around tv and really fed up with dealing with it and being really unhappy to make the jump you know because the other thing that happens you know like most of us you know when you go into if you if you're not used to making money and you go into a profession or even if you are used to making money and you go to a profession and you start to make money it's then very difficult to get off that roundabout because what happens is you make a little bit of money so you buy a nicer house you have a nicer car you know you're you can buy stuff for your kids and and so you're kind of you, you know you i think we all get caught up in this or a lot of people get caught up in this you know you accelerate your lifestyle i i am that's one of the things i've had to be very mindful of because i think for myself when i made the decision to go and be more creative i actually had to decelerate my lifestyle so I was someone who, you know, I went to a top like business school. Most of my classmates are now partners at management consulting firms or, you know, like high level VPs in investment banks. And I'm hoping that when, you know, thing, you know, when I have my break or things get better for me creatively, I make money, I don't accelerate my lifestyle because I went from, you know, earning sort of business school type of money to, I actually had like a mental breakdown. I ended up, and the only way for me to keep a roof over my head and to stay near my daughter who's living with my ex was um, I delivered pizzas at Pizza Hut. So you can imagine what that pays. Mm. And, you know, right now I just work as a freelancer, which again is tough, but I think as an artist or a creative, you, um, you can't put a price on freedom and flexibility to do, you know, to work in a way that allows you to do what it is that you want to do. Because yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think it's good to stay. I think the smart me. people, and I've not always been smart <laughs> at all, but the smart people kind of try and keep their overhead down. You know, they keep their overhead down, even and in fact, particularly when they're making good money. Um, because what that allows you to do is that allows you the ability to say no to things. Yeah. Oh, and that's that's really that's really important is because a lot of times that there's it's always kind of when you look at the origin stories of a lot of stuff that does well and blows up very often it's it's exactly the david seidler story it's something that someone was really emotionally invested in you know and, and we can talk about the you know we can talk about the business side and the business side is important but that's what people connect to yeah, you, know? you can't. You, the thing is, is that it's good to be business savvy, but focusing on that and getting an agent, if you actually haven't even got the kernel of an idea, something that makes you want to get up and write it, it's not going to happen. No, and, and also, I mean, the other thing with agents um, and people get, and I and look, I get it. I was absolutely obsessed with getting an agent, you know, when I was in my twenties. Yeah. Um, and the thing with it, and, and then what happened was, you know, I was, I was teaching, I wasn't very happy. I wrote a screenplay, which was a kind of quite a small contained thriller. And I wrote it in like two weeks of the Easter holidays, barricaded in my room. And um, I wrote that script and my life changed within six months. You know, within, within six months of writing that script, I had an agent at Peter Fraser Dunlop, which was, you know, at the time, a very big, I mean, it still is a big agency, but God has gone through some kind of changes. Um, and then, and then he asked me, what do you want to do? And I, you know, I was quite, I'd grown up writing Brookside, so I was interested in doing that. And I, and I was on that show and I'd quit teaching all within six months of finishing that script. Um, and, and that's just the magic of, and it wasn't, a, it was okay. You know, look back on it now. You, I mean, and you got on and you did something. Yeah, you do someone. And also, the other thing is, you know, I mean, I see sometimes people who are um, uh, probably need to choose my words carefully here because because you'll you'll hear it from other writers. You'll hear people who've been working on someone for years and years and years. And really, my approach now is: I write something, I finish it, I move on. You That's know? a approach. I've heard that from quite often. It's actually from artists who actually are, you know, paid artists, paid writers who do it professionally. Writers. Because it's never, 
I mean, it's what's never going to happen is, and this and this just does not happen, is people fall into this trap of you have this, and I have it with every book or every script I write. I have this idealized, slightly blurry vision of what it's going to be, and then it never survives contact with the written page. You know, like once you start writing it, it's not that because how can it be? Because you have this like kind of dream fantasy of what it's going to be and what it's going to do, and then you actually have to write it. And if I can get to if I can get to like 70% of what I thought it was, that's pretty good, you know? Um, but but you see people get trapped where they, where they have someone they've been working on for ages and ages, and they have all this emotional investment in it, in this story. And then, and they just keep writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it. And by the way, it's fine to write someone and then put it away and write something else and then come back to it. You know, there's no problem with that. You're saying you not, but not, but not tearing yourself away from that project ever. That's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So you've just kind of, you've got to kind of, I mean, you know, the other advantage I had one side, um, and I think Irvin Welch has said, uh, has said this as well, is that, you know, I'm not going to be employed to do anything else at this stage of my life, you know? So when I quit writing TV and I wrote the book, I mean, I think the reason I wrote a book that worked was I had to fucking sell it. You know, I had a family. You know, when, when I sold that, when I sold lockdown, I was paying my mortgage with a credit card. That is not good, man. That's, as, that's as, not as, good. Someone, as someone who's divorced, took a, a wrecking ball to his credit score, I can attest to that. Yeah, so you've, so, the, but there, and, and by the way, I'm not saying like, you know, watch this podcast, get up, throw a cup of coffee over your boss and, and walk out and say, I'm going to be a writer. I'm not saying that, but, what I'm saying is that it's it's amazing how when you have to make things work, when you have to, you're like you have no alternative, or you feel like you have no alternative. Um, things, you know, you you'll find reserves and you'll find ability, and you'll find a work ethic that you you know that you that you weren't aware that you had, and then and then the challenge is 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 not forgetting about that and, and staying in touch with that. But for the most part, yeah, it's about getting up every morning and doing the work and, you know, and to circle back, you know, things like uh, London Writers uh, Salon. I wrote a whole novel just in those Zoom calls over about three months. I used to do two or three of the calls um, a day. I had it outlined. And I used to sit down and I would do like two, 3,000 words a day in, in those Zoom sessions. And that's how I got that book done. Just because, because I would say, okay, that calls at eight o'clock, you know? And also, yeah, it was a, it was a super supportive of um, environment. Um, and also, you know, Martin Parrell, one of the first things uh, I, I kind of felt when I, when I joined that group was they're good people. You know, like you can tell the vibe they give off. They are good, sound, supportive people. It's incredible because I think on, I think both of us were on today's 8am call in London. Um, and there was a lady there saying that she had actually joined a different writers group. And she said it was a horrific experience. And that it had actually scarred her. And she had joined this community, and even though she got the impression that the energy was good because of what happened in the other group. She had to wait and then come on board. But like, yeah, on, on the base. Yeah, I mean, I'm not like I'm not a big fan of. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like uh, of like writers groups and just you know critique groups in general. I'm just not a. Um, I don't. Maybe, I don't. maybe because I had a lot of it in TV, you know, and I, so I had a lot. Of, I had to deal with a lot of feedback there. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, the other problem with, with some of these groups is not, not this one. And I think it's good because it's much more generalized. It's all kinds of writing. But, actually, but, but it's also a support group. So this is the thing yeah. that 
I, I hear stories of people being in, in um, writers groups where everyone's got to read each other's work, everyone's got to do detailed critique and analysis. And I, it just doesn't appeal to me, either doing it for other people's work or having it done to mine. So there's a clubhouse call I do once a week. Sometimes it lasts two hours, sometimes it lasts one. It depends on how many people turn up. And literally, we put, someone pulls a prompt out of a book, you've got five minutes to write, and just everyone just reads their piece. Mm. Everyone reads their piece, and everyone gives supportive comments. And all that really does is that, A, it gives a space where everyone is forced to write, and then B, actually, it gives the encouragement which ends up creating the momentum where once you're out of that, you go and do more stuff. That's a, that's a big part of it. I mean, I, 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 I'm a big believer in doing uh, sprints. If, if someone's stuck writing, um, you know, set your... I mean, I'll, I'll really break it down if I really have to write someone. So I will literally have, like, a piece of paper on my desk saying, open file, get white noise on your phone, put on your headphones, you know, or listen to movie soundtracks or whatever set your timer on your phone, you know, the Pomodoro method, 25 yeah. minutes. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be 10, it could be an hour. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Set that and then have, have a condensed um, a condensed space of time. The other thing that's, uh, this, is, this is slightly tangential, but I think, um, I think it's helpful as well, is one of the things I've noticed just generally in life in terms of mental health and, all the, and, and how I feel about myself, there is no, if I write 2,000 words in a day, I just feel awesome, you know? And I think we, again, it's, it comes back to this idea of work and most of us, you know, do work that we, we don't feel as valuable or that isn't satisfying. But if, if, if I can sit down and, I mean, a day when I get to like five o'clock and I've managed to, you know, get to the gym and I've, you know, or I've gone training and, um, you know, I've done, you know, I've done 2000 words. That's like, that's a, a that's a great, I'm, I'm a happy, I'm just happy, you know, like uh, all sorts of other horrible things could have happened, but I'm, I'm good, you know, but you have to sit down, you know, you have to sit down and do the work. And then I think the, and then I think the other thing that people kind of need to understand or that might help people is if you sat down to write a novel or write a screenplay and think, I've got to write a novel, you'd never start. You know, you, you have to break it down into bite. I mean, I've written like, I don't know, like 70 episodes of TV and like, you know, 18 books, most of which are about 75,000 words. Um, and that's a lot, but I just did it by sitting down every day and doing 500 words or doing a thousand words or doing 2000 words yeah it accumulates and, like brian accumulates, you know because brian uh, said this he he was working as um he was an a and r guy you know like he actually um i think he helped launch tracy chapman's first album because his dad was also a, you know a record exec and he said that he would just get up in the morning and he would just make sure he did one, at least one page of his screenplay because he's like in a third of a year, you can basically get a 120 page film, first draft done, if you just chunk it into that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you don't need, it's weird, now that, now that I do it full time, you know, I, I probably do about the same amount of writing, well, maybe not quite, but um, I could probably go, don't tell my wife this, but I mean, I could probably go do a full time job or or a part-time job and also get the same amount of writing done. It's not really the time, you know? If, I mean, most of my writing I do in like, you know, the book I wrote in um, uh, London Writer's Salon, I was doing, you know, two of those sessions a day, three on a good day, three sessions. A, so that's like, those sessions are maybe only really, you're only really writing for 45 minutes. So that's an hour and a half. You yeah. know, and I wrote that book in three months. I mean, a lot of writers will say this, that actually, you know, the concentrated time with your hand resting on a page, even as a professional writer, you're probably looking at one to three hours. Yeah. You're using the entire day. 
No, no. But I mean, but but the other thing about doing it every day is it is it keeps your mind connected to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I think that's why I, it I would be... agree. Hmm? No, I, I would agree. So um, yeah. again, you know, this is sounding like I'm turning it into like a you know fanboys of uh, Brian Koppelman session, but he said that when he finally read Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, and he started doing morning pages, just the act of turning up and doing the pages. He said that within a year, he had a career as a professional screenwriter that was able to leave behind his day job. Oh, yeah. Because doing the morning pages has other tangential benefits. It made it a lot more easier for him to turn up and go, all right, I'm going to do my one page of the screenplay as well as this three page practice. Yeah, once, once you get started, I mean, the only thing you can do, which could be really helpful, is to keep um, a spreadsheet. You know, that could be, I would, I would definitely recommend that. I'd do it for a month or a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Where you, you literally have the date, you have the time you're writing, when you stopped, where you were. You yeah. know, you can put down all the, the other things that are going on and you can start to see when's, you know, some people are better right out. I, I prefer to write in the morning and at least get something done. And the other thing is once you start writing in the morning or once you start writing in general is you create a, you create momentum. You know, if I get like a thousand words done by like, you know, nine, nine, 10 a.m., I can go on and do two, three thousand words, no problem. But if I've not done anything by, you know, midday, you know, the day is probably a bust. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, you can you can you can definitely create kind of momentum that way. Sure. But I, there's, I mean, the, the thing with all of this is there's no secret to it. You know, read you know, read whether it's screenplays or whether it's novels, read as much as you can and write. And I mean, that's it, you know, yeah. and that's it. And yeah. you'll, you know, and you, and you might, you might, you might not get to wherever you want to go, go in, but you'll certainly be better. You know, you'll certainly improve. Okay. Um, David. So, I mean, look, you talk about, you know, your time in TV you know, your time, particularly working in uh, Brookside, which I knew about, and I had no idea you worked on Biker Grove as well. Um, and then obviously you said that look, you'd reached a point where you weren't enjoying it in TV. And then obviously you went and then you started writing novels. And again, you sort of said that, you know, you had to make your first one a success because otherwise, you know, you don't want to fall into arrears on your mortgage or not look after your family. Um, but from what I recall, that decision was slightly sort of forced, like you were fired from Brookside. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah. Like, I mean, how I made, came about? Yeah, I mean, I made the transition. Um, so I, I did a couple more shows after I left Brookside. But, uh, but the Brookside experience taught me um, something really important. Um, and that was, I think sometimes uh, there's a time to leave. And, you know, if you're not enjoying it, and I think that was, I think that was, I mean, well, I mean, the first thing to say is that everyone was fired off Brookside eventually. I mean, that was like, you know, that was, I mean, I think when I, I think when I was fired on that writing team, I was like the sixth or seventh longest serving writer on the team. And, and people would come in, people would come in and be hired to write that show. And sometimes they wouldn't even write a script before they got fired, you know, because if you didn't contribute in the in story conference in the writer's room, then you just got, you just got fucked out the door. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a very, I mean, being fired is not nice. I mean, it's a very, you know, you're going to take it personally. I've, I've been uh, fired for my fair share of jobs, so yeah, I, I can relate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't really matter what the job is. It's not nice. You know, it's kind of, it's another form of rejection, isn't it? You know, unless you've, unless you've really done something and you know, you know, it's coming down the track. Um, I mean, the worst part of being fired from Brookside is they made me drive all the way down from Northumberland to Liverpool <laughs> to fire me. And then I had to drive that back. Sav- that is savage. What was the drive but, home like? I don't know. I think I think I'd like phone my wife, and you know, I was kind of in shock. I was in shock, but also like a lot of like a lot of endings of like jobs or relationships or whatever. There was also an element of relief because I just wasn't happy. You know, I didn't think the show. I, 
I didn't think the show was very good. Uh, you know, uh, uh, by that point, in fact, I thought it was really bad. Um, I thought some of the decisions that had been made, because there was a lot of pressure from the channel to, to take it in certain directions, you know, and I understood why, you know, there's a lot of people made their living from that show in Liverpool, so you want to keep the show on air. But, you know, creatively, a lot of the decisions were kind of, you know, ridiculous. Um, so I think it was one of those things where I wasn't so much fired as I was put out of my misery. Um, and then I kind of, then I kind of, uh, you know, did a few more TV shows and uh, just got to a point on the last show where I just quit. You know, like I had, I had some feedback on a script and I'm, I'm still friends with the person that I kind of, you know, fell out with at the time over it, you know, it's a good person. Um, but it was just, an, it was an accumulation of, you know, creative work is not like other work in as much as you don't, you can't just clock in and clock out. You know, you're, you're, you're leaving a little bit of, even if it's an episode of Biker Grove or something dumb happens, you know, you're, you're putting yourself into it, you know? So, so if you're, it's just very difficult if you're, if you're not enjoying what you're doing creatively, but then you're relying upon doing that work to make money and pay your bills and, and, and look after a family, um, you know, that's, that's not a positive, you know, that's not, a I mean, that in general, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's half the problem with the world at the moment. I mean, that's why we have, you know, that's why we have people abuse alcohol, people abuse drugs, people are violent because, you know, they're trapped by, you know, they're trapped by their, you know, economic and domestic circumstances, you know, and listen, I shouldn't be pissing and moaning, you know, I was making like 70 grand, you know, doing not a lot of work, um, really per hour, and, you know, I wasn't digging ditches, you know, I, you know, I wasn't curing cancer, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty cushy number, you know, most people regard it as a pretty cushy number, and, and, and I got fired, Mm -hmm. um and 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 just generally in film and tv you are going to get fired you know i think most screenwriters will tell you you know the, the first thing you know that that's the only thing you know after you get hired is at some point you're going to get taken off that project especially in hollywood where there's multiple writers yeah. on a project so you better be able just to just to deal with it and just accept it as someone that's going to happen and you're going to take a project as far as you can take it or you're going to work on a show up to a certain point and then you're not anymore. Um, and, and a lot of times it's just not, it's not, it's just not personal, you know? It's, it's not about you. It's just yeah. one of those things that happened. Um, so, yeah, but having said that, you know, I, I've never been happier than I've been writing novels, you know, which was what I originally planned on doing all those years ago before I went to film school. Um, and I think a big part of that is because I have complete creative control. I mean, it was that was the big shock when I, you know, when I signed my first book deal was if people wanted changes, they were super polite about suggesting them. And if you didn't want to change it, you didn't change it. Um, and I like that because I'm a bit of a, you know, I'm a bit of a control freak, you know. And and if I if I do someone if I do someone that doesn't work out, I I find it much more easier to forgive myself than to forgive someone else, you know, who's imposed that who's imposed that change on me. Yeah, but like taking, you know, and I, it sounds like such a privileged thing to say, but taking money out of the equation of this before we move on. One of the things that comes to my mind that I've thought about it myself is how do you reconcile certain competing priorities and interests? Because on one hand, you know, you talk about the needs that, you know, you talk about the need to not keep doing stuff that you're not enjoying, which kind of ties into the principle of we've only got a limited or finite amount of time on this planet. Yeah. Yet at the same time, you're talking about how some of these gigs actually accelerate, rapidly accelerate your developmental and learning curve. So what would you say to, you know, um, emerging writers in terms of, you know, 
how do you strike that balance? Because on one hand, you can get into that and it's the velvet coffin. But on the other hand, I'm not fully convinced that just giving the middle finger to that stuff and saying, no, I'm going to do my own thing is necessarily the right thing as well. Because it sounds almost like anyone, most script writers or writers could benefit, even if it was a six to 15 month stint in doing it and then bouncing out. So how do you reconcile those things? And like, you know, what kind of advice do you give to emerging writers? I mean, I think the thing is with everything I've, everything I've done, when I started doing it, I wanted to do it. Okay. You know, I've never done anything. I've never taken anything on that, you know, I, I thought. So, so thought with Brooks, like, yeah. it was. Just, yeah, I wanted to oh, do that. I to contribute to the story there. Yeah, but you know, just um, probably for kind of nostalgic reasons, because that was a that was a show I grew up watching. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember and, it as well. And uh, but but the show I arrived to write was not that show. Um, yeah. But having said that, you know, but was, yeah, the the first year or so, you know, it was a great experience. Um, but I think there's, you know, it's like a party, isn't it? You know, it, it's good to know. You know, now is the time to leave this party. You know, this is, you know, either, you know, I've had too much to drink or things are about to get messy or, you know, whatever it is and, and move on to the and move on to the next thing. So, but yeah, if you're, but I mean, also, especially if you're talking about, you know, making a living at it, when you're starting out, you know, I would, I would you know, you know, I said yes to most things because I wasn't being offered that much. Whereas now there's lots of things I could go and do that I've just got no interest in doing just because I, I you know, my time is, you know, my time is limited, mm -hmm. you know? So, I, and I think as you get older, you know, and, you know, especially, you know, I'm at the age now where people kind of my age, they're not dying in droves, but you're, you know, you know, people that have died um, and, you know, and so that stuff becomes a lot more concrete. You know, and it kind of focuses your mind. So it's not maybe so much about money or accolades or awards as it is about doing work that's going to be there, you know, when you're gone. Okay. And so I think earlier at the beginning of our chat, you talked about how your writing rapidly accelerated um, when you started taking research seriously, as opposed to just kind of sitting there, I guess, and just trying to conjure things out of your mind. Uh, hoping you could talk more about that because I think didn't you train as a bodyguard for one? Yeah, I've done all sorts. And you and you also there was another crime story where you actually went and spent time in a supermax prison in the US. I was watching an yeah. interview on TV about that earlier today. So if you want to touch upon those because this this sounds like like we hear about writers doing research, but this sounds almost like what method actors do for acting, like you taking it to that level as a writer. So if you want to talk Yeah, about so when I was when I was kind of looking, when I was still on TV, um, this would be back around like 2007. Um, if you remember, there was a there was a booming industry in um in people going out to do private security in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And um and I just became kind of fascinated by this idea. And people were offering bodyguard training courses. So pretty much anyone could rock up and do, um, I think it's a security industry authority or whatever it is, SIA course that runs for about a month. And um, I thought that would make, I thought it would make a great TV show. I was going to write a TV script. So I had a kind of moment of madness and I had a little bit of spare cash and I signed up to go off and do what, do this three and a half week course. Uh, they call it close protection, but essentially it's bodyguarding course. And I just had an absolute blast. Um, so we did, uh, we did, I think most of it was in, in this disused army camp in Wales near Rill. And uh, the rest of it was in the Czech Republic. And we did uh, firearms training in the Czech Republic. And it was basically just like a three and a half week version of like Top Gear, you know, when Top Gear was still fun. And um, so I did that and I wrote the TV script and I couldn't sell the TV script, but I, I um, thought, well, there's a book here. Um, and what, it, what that kind of did for me 
was it, it kind of gave me the confidence to write to write about that world from a point of view of someone that hadn't just watched some films and read a few books. Like, so it wasn't even the fact that I learned, you know, the lingo and, you know, you know, what the procedure would be for certain security situations. I think a big part of it was that, you know, two of the instructors were uh, retired Ro Royal Military Police Close Protection Unit. Um, and so I got to hang out with them. And that's the other thing we're researching. It's not even necessarily getting the technical details. It's just you get to meet people, you know. And very often you'll find what I found with those guys was that my expectations of what they would be like and what they were like in reality were two different things. And in general, I mean, I tend to write quite a lot about very kind of masculine um, environments and about violence. And what I find is that um, people we might assume are super macho actually they conduct themselves in a completely different way you know when we were looking at the um you know when we're looking at the events of yes yesterday i don't know when this is going out but yesterday when you know england yeah, played the, the england, euro, euro 2021 the, final. yeah the final and all the kind of carry on and the, the casual violence and all the rest of it um there there is no one who's confident there's no man that's confident in their masculinity who's behaving in that sort of manner. You know, that's just, I mean, to me, I look at the, the people behaving like that and, you know, abusing people or racially abusing them or, you know, trying to fight stewards. I mean, th those are, you know, those are, those are weak people. You know, strong people don't, don't, don't behave like that. Um, so, so the two things that came away from that research was, was were, were kind of the technical details, but more importantly, just spending time with people that had worked in those sorts of environments. And also the other thing is, obviously, Iraq and Afghanistan were, you know, were politically highly charged. And what I found with, it, with the people that had been in those places, they were well aware of the politics behind it, you know. They were, they were well aware of, you know, who was paying them and why, you know, and, and what those invasions were about. Now, they were going in and doing, and, and doing that job, but, but they, were, they were, you know, they weren't wrapped themselves in the flag and, and sing God Save the Queen, you know, unstinting patriotism types of characters. They knew, they knew exactly what the deal was. But on the other hand, um, they were adrenaline junkies, you know? So they would, they would come out of the Royal Military Police and then, you know, within very short order, you know, they'd be, they'd be back in Afghanistan doing, doing private security because they enjoyed, you know, they enjoyed the buzz of being in that environment where, you know, anything could happen at any particular, you know, moment in time. So, so that was very helpful. And then obviously that becomes a great way to kind of spin the marketing for the book. So for the, the second book in the series, Deadlock, um, I visited, spent a little bit of time inside Pelican Bay Supermax in the north of California. And I'm planning a new series and I'm actually going to revisit that world, um, the world of kind of prison gangs in California for the, for the new series. And again, that was something that, you know, you can watch documentaries, you can read books, but you don't really get a feel for something. And, and you know, uh, to the same extent as you do when you step inside that, that sort of environment. And I'm just, I'm just, I've always been fascinated with subcultures, you know, and, and I'm always fascinated in, in worlds that we don't really, you know, we kind of glimpse, but very few people get to experience you know it's it's why it's why i'm interested in you know in mixed martial arts and and that kind of world because uh you know i mean i i train now I've trained for the past four years in brazilian jiu-jitsu and when you when you're inside that world it's something very very different um and again uh, you know it's a world that to the out to to, to most people seems ultra macho and you know, the embodiment of toxic masculinity. Um, 
but in terms of the people that do it, you know, people couldn't be more wrong. Um, but but I also think that that touches upon you know having more accurate descriptions of what toxic masculinity is and isn't because sometimes it feels like when people talk about toxic masculinity, anything that is quote unquote overtly masculine is toxic. Whereas I I beg to differ. There are certain things that obviously are toxic masculinity, such as you know I'd say patriarchy or certain types of gender roles, but people. I don't know, going and doing things like a martial art and competing, especially because of what you've said with regards to actually those sorts of people are far more gentle, more considered, and more likely to want to avoid violence, that actually it's a more positive form of masculinity. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, I love pointing out to people because toxic masculinity has become this kind of, you know, like woke, it's become this kind of, you know, phrase that people, you know, on the right, love to kind of love to kind of throw around and you know snowflake and woke and toxic masculinity and i love to point out particularly to young men uh toxic masculinity as a phrase was invented by the men's rights movement you know by the mythopoetic men's rights movement you know back okay. in the back okay. in the back in the um 70s and 80s and the, re and, and the reason they, 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 they had that label and had that brand was to differentiate what they saw as positive masculinity from, from things that were, you know, toxic, hyper-masculinity in other words. You know, so again, you know, some of the behaviour we saw, you know, on, on display in, in London, you know, or even just simple things like, you know, a woman walking past a, a building site and, and being catcalled. I mean, or, you know, I mean, that's toxic, you know, that's absolutely toxic masculinity. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, that was not, a, that, that's not a creation of the, that's not a creation of the, of the left, of the liberal left, you know, that's, that's, that was a creation of the, of the, of the men's rights movement. But yeah, I mean, that's certainly, a, that's certainly a theme that, um, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm interested in exploring. And I think writers in general, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. Um, I mean, all the stuff I enjoy is where, you know, a writer um, will show me a world that I think I understood, but I'll learn something about it. And it'll also deepen my understanding of, of human nature and, and why people behave in the way they do. And also fundamentally, um, this idea, you know, we, we, we're very much in a structure, uh, in a culture now where where we love our villains you know people have to be either all bad or all good you know and it's the great trick of the british tabloid press is to build someone up you know and then and then destroy that person yeah. and and one of the things that writing's given me is you know when you have to write different characters is that people are not all there's no such thing as all good or all bad we're all a kind of weird mixture of kind of good on our good days and shitty on our shitty days. No, I agree. So going more into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, how did you get into that? And just talk to me about the last few years and just what it's done for you, whether it's creatively or your mental health. Because I know outside of uh, you know, our conversation today, uh, it's something you've spoken at great length about, and I think it's also influenced a potential project you're working on. So if we can go into that, yeah. So the yeah, so the, the novel I wrote um, last year in the in the in those Zoom calls with uh, London Writer Salon uh, is is a young adult novel about someone who's an amputee who uh, is bullied at school and ends up training at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in an MMA gym. Uh, so I think that, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the kind of internal, emotional, mental changes he undergoes um, through the course of the, through the course of the story are things that I encountered when I started to train it, train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, how I got into it was like a lot of people in Ireland, uh, Conor McGregor blew up as this kind of global mixed martial arts superstar. I hadn't paid a lot of attention to it before that. You know, growing up, I'd watched boxing, but I always thought it was kind of, it seemed really brutal. It wasn't someone that interested me. Um, and I can understand why, you know, people, you know, they see people somewhat, you know, they see 
you know, someone on the floor of a cage getting punched repeatedly in the face and they decide that's not for them. I, I completely get that. Um, I mean, it is, it is very kind of viscerally violent. Um, so I, uh, so I kind of got interested in him and through my interest in him, decided to uh, start training. And so when I went to the, the gym where I still currently train Team KF in um, Dublin, um, they said, well, look, you know, would you, uh, you know, rather than doing stand up, rather than doing striking, would you like to try some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is basically ground based grappling, it's submission grappling. So the idea being, uh, you fight someone, but there's no punches, there's no elbows, there's no kicks allowed. It's kind of a hybrid of wrestling and judo. And the, the idea is to uh, make the other person submit by tapping. So they tap and you do that either by, uh, by joint locks, so like an arm bar where you would force pressure on their arm or their, or their shoulder or by uh, choking or really strangling them. So that, you know, the famous rear naked choke where you cut off the blood supply to their carotid artery. And, um, and if they don't tap, they, you know, they're, they become unconscious. Um, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, I just thought it was, it, it's funny now because it's become, you know, you can see Anthony Bourdain was, was, was a great proponent of it. I was, I was going to bring that up because I was actually going to say the timing of us talking was great because the last few days um, I've been overdosing on um, one of Anthony Bourdain's shows, which was Parts Unknown. And in a few instances, like the episode where he's in the Bay Area, he's just training and he talks about how much he loves it. So, yeah, it's become more popular. Yeah, and, uh, and obviously Russell Brand um, trains now and obviously... The, really? Yeah, Russell what Brand's that? a blue belt. Russell Brand is a blue belt like myself and uh, he talks he's very interesting when he talks about it and I think a lot of the, a lot of the things that he found interesting about it are the things that I found interesting about it um which is it's 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 physical it's physically very demanding um but also it's incredibly um mentally and intellectually en engaging I think Anthony Bourdain you know described it as as chess with the human body and that's and that's exactly that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. So it's um it's very so it's very technical. Um, but the the I think one of the main benefits I get from it is you know we talk a lot these days about mindfulness. And when you're uh, when you're sparring, when you they call it rolling, when you're rolling with someone, when you're sparring with a person, you're you're fighting. Um, it's the ultimate uh, mindfulness exercise. Because there is absolutely no, there's absolutely no way you can think about anything else when you have another human being trying to choke you unconscious. It's just it's completely impossible. Um, and the other thing that attracted me to it was the fact that, as I mentioned before, I'm an amputee. And so what I do when I train is I take my prosthetic leg off because obviously I would be a danger to myself and mostly others if I clocked someone with a titanium knee. And once you're on the ground, what I discovered is that as an amputee, you actually have advantages over able-bodied people, um, not only in terms of positions. So, for instance, you could be um, one of the joint locks they do is leg locks. Well, I only have one leg. So I have, as they pointed out to me in week one, I have 50% less chance of being leg locked than anyone else in that gym. Um, and then obviously also when you're competing, uh, you compete in weight divisions. And because I let my leg, if I still had it, would weigh about 10 kilograms. Um, I actually, in terms of my upper body, the rest of my body, I'm much bigger when I compete at featherweight. So when someone's, when I have someone on the ground, which is the idea is to take them down to the ground. When I have someone on the ground, I'm much more powerful uh, than someone than someone in my in my weight category. So I just kind of I just kind of fell in love with it. I fell in love with the social side of it. And the thing to say about that is, uh, I mean, I was over in before we before all you know the pandemic happened. 
uh, the previous summer I was over in LA, I was training in LA and um, I went to a visit at a gym and I'm looking across the mat and there's this kind of slightly pudgy guy, apologies if he ever hears this, with a beard. And I thought, I, I, I know this guy, you know, I, I recognize this guy. And I was looking over him, he's looking over at me and he went, um, oh, I'm Jonah. And I said, hey, I'm David, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, blah. and I realized it was the actor Jonah Hill. Um, but the but the but the the funny thing about the social side of it is, it's it's one of the few places in our society on those mats where no one cares what race you are, no one cares what your socioeconomic status is or what your job is, no one cares what your religion is, no one cares if you're gay or straight or somewhere in the middle, no one cares about your gender. I mean, if you want a real fright, you know, you roll with um, some of the women from our gym. I mean, the, you know, I, you know, they will, they will absolutely, you know, they'll take a 200 pound guy and make a fool of him if he's not trained, you know, they'll just, they'll just tap him repeatedly. So it's just given me, it's just given me, and also the other thing is, which I've missed in the pandemic is, it's, it's literally and figuratively the closest you can get to another human being. You know, you're literally attached to that other person. And I think there is someone that happens biochemically. So what you tend to find is because there's, because there's that transfer of hormones, but also you're trusting that when you tap, when you basically submit and you say, look, you got me, you're trusting that other person to let go. Because if they, if they don't let, if they don't let go either, they're going to break your arm or mm -hmm. they're going to potentially kill you. Well, I mean, they, they, they will kill you if they keep a choke on. Um, you know, after a certain period of time. So what you find is that you form very quickly, you form very strong relationships with the people you train with. And it's, and it's a relationship on a very deep level. So I think that, so, so when I wrote the book, I just wanted to, and, and also the other thing is no one, just as gender and religion and race, no one cares about that. No one cares about disability either. You know, like if you're there and you're training, you're all good, you know? Um, so yeah, so that was, so it's probably the, it's probably the best thing I've, I've done in the last 20 or 30 years. It's been the most helpful to me. And also I think from, a, from the point of view of a writer, I think also it's good to have, if this is your career and your, and your work and everything else, it's, it's really, I think it's really important to have something outside that. So like the guys in my gym, you know, they know I'm a writer and all that, you know, and some of them will read some of the books and whatever, but they're, they're like, they're not interested in that. You know, they couldn't give a shit that I met Lee Child. Or that, you know, I don't know how I got them excited when I told them that. And they were like, oh, did Dave, did you get your picture with Jonah Hill? I was like, no, don't be an idiot. Because um, he was there to train as well. You know, that was the experience for him was just there to train and be a, you know, regular guy. Um, but yeah, no, it's given, it's given me a ton. It's given me a ton of things. Okay. And I think, uh, you know, sort of sidestepping to something else, which is just as a writer, the way in which sort of publishing has sort of changed. So I know that at one point you left your publisher and you saw the potential of Kindle eBooks. Mm -hmm. You went indie and now you're hybrid. Can you talk a little bit more about just those decisions um, and what basically how they've potentially impacted you both economically and creatively? Yeah. I mean, I think I was very happy to uh, publish traditionally. And really, when I sold the first book back in 2008, that was really the only way to go. You know, Kindle, I, I think Kindle was like 2011 when that, that came out. Um, and so when I sold the rights to the, the first three books, I sold world rights. Um, well, world rights, I sold everything to that publisher in London. And, uh, and then... I've always been fairly good at spotting trends, you know, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, I've always been kind of like, you know, had a, you know, I was one of those kids that had like a ZX81 computer when I was a kid, you know, it was kind of geeky. 
Um, so I've always been, you know, I've always kind of kept up broadly with what's going on with technology. Um, so I'd signed a traditional publishing contract and then I got to like, I had to re-up and sign another deal for another two books. And um, what I, I saw the potential of the Kindle. I, I kind of knew it was going to take off. And the reason I knew it was going to take off is my father-in-law in the States is a huge reader. He is, he's like the dream reader for publishers because he'll pay $25 for a, a hardback, you know, book when it comes out. And he'll, he'll read, you know, at least one novel a week. That, you know, that's what he does for relaxation. And, uh, and he'd gotten a Kindle. He just moved to Kindle. And so he was just getting his books on a Kindle. And so when he, when he made that switch, I, that, was, that was the real light bulb moment when I thought, oh, this is, this is going to be something now. This is going to be really disruptive. And then it became a no brainer because a publisher will pay you 25% of the, the profit from the ebook. Um, that's that that's net you know that's not gross that's that's net uh, whereas amazon through amazon kdp kindle direct publishing they'll give you 70 percent so um so what i did at that point we were negotiating the deal for the the next two books and also my editor had left and i had a really good relationship with her and you know she was moving on so that wasn't great. And um, so I said, look, I'll do one more book for you. And I'll, and I'll, and it, they weren't going to offer me as much money, which was fine. Um, and I'll, I'll take like half the advance I got on the previous books, but I want you to give me back uh, my North American rights and the rights that you haven't sold. And that allowed me to publish those books, self-publish those books on Amazon. And it's been... It, it's just been great, you know. I would never, uh, I would never rule out doing another traditional publishing deal. Um, but if you look at the market for fiction, genre fiction, uh, romance, thriller, mystery, suspense, um, you know, most of those books now in in the US are are ebook, um, and certainly the, the the you know the the most of the romance writers that were doing well publish independently now um I, you know there's there's very few that are still publishing traditionally um just because it's that 70 percent you know you and if you're if you're able to um you know if you're able to contract with an editor to have it proofread and and copy edited if you're able to work with a cover designer, if you've got a little bit of technical know-how and increasingly if you know a little bit about digital marketing, um, you know, it, it's a bit of a no-brainer because the thing that most people don't realize when they sign with a publisher is you will be marketing that book. They will not be marketing the book. They will expect, even if you get paid a lot of money, you're going you're gonna to have to do the bulk of it. Um, so, you know, you're going to... Yeah, so it's just so why why give why hand over the bulk of the money from the book if what they're doing is essentially paper distribution for a market that's no longer paper. Um, I would say that my caveat would be if you're paid a huge advance, because with advances you don't have to pay them back, even if you're even if the book doesn't sell, you get to keep that money. If you get offered a huge advance or if you're writing in certain genres where it's still more bookshop based, then it might be worth taking a traditional publishing deal. You know, otherwise, for me at this stage, probably not. OK, cool. And I think as we sort of yeah come close to the close of uh, our conversation today, um, you spoke about the fact that you're working on a brand new series of thrillers. I won't say any more. Do you want to touch a bit more on that yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of, um, I've written 12 books in the Ryan Locke series and a bit like Brookside near the end, I need a break. Um, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm slightly burnt out writing those characters. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot about the last year or two, again, connected to Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd murder and, and just generally this idea around policing. And I know, I think a lot of people who are writing crime fiction, 
you're starting, we're starting to ask the question, or we should be asking the question, you know, who should be the heroes in our books? You know, because, uh, because a lot of times, a lot of times police officers, you know, are, are not the heroes in the real life stories, you know, certainly not in the US. Um, and, you know, and I think partly that's a function of their, um, you know, they're constrained by the institution. And if the institution is rotten, then mm. it's, you know, it's very difficult to be, a, you know, a you good could argue the case in the UK with the McPherson report and even, um, you know, the way the police were during the troubles in terms of towards uh, Irish diaspora in the UK. So you could argue that it's just, you know, those institutions are a certain space where, you know, you, those sorts of characters uh, end up residing. Well, I mean, I mean, the thing is, you know, police forces of 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 they're about catching criminals, however you define crime. Um, but I mean, to a large extent, they're about you know they're about social control, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, I did a I did a um, conference. I was asked to speak at a conference at London School of Economics about prisons, and uh, I found myself kind of in the uh, I found myself increasingly in a weird position where. Um, I'm slightly in the middle, you know. I'm slightly in the middle because um, there was a there was a, you know, there was a lot of people, uh, and there was a few people at that conference that I felt were well intentioned but naive. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, I think there are absolutely, undoubtedly, certain people in society that need to be removed from society and held somewhere. To keep us all safe, I, I mean, I just I don't I, I don't have any problem with saying that. However, if you look, especially in the US and probably increasingly in the UK, there's a lot of people, probably the majority of people in prison, particularly women, have got no business being there. Yeah, I mean, you they have no business. You look, the, you look at the incarceration rates in, like you said, the US, and it feels like the UK. Um, you know, every time the US sneezes, we catch a cold and we sort of follow suit. Um, they're in there for nonviolent crimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and it's funny because we have, you know, on the one hand, we have public, um, we have public fear and public perception. And then what we have, and then we have what is actually punished. You know, and a lot of times the, the, the crimes that the crimes that really upset people Either it's very difficult in the case of sex, sex crimes to get convictions, um, or in the case of you know financial crimes and frauds and people just destroying other people's lives, people get a, you know can afford a high priced lawyer and they get away with it or they serve a couple of years in a cushy, cushy prison. So anyway, so so that with the new the, the new series, with with the space I write in, a lot of the protagonists are either cops or they're military or ex military. So I was trying to think, come up with a different protagonist. So the protagonist in this is going to be um, someone who's been a convict and he's been a shot caller for a prison guy. But the, the, the twist is that he was, he was innocent. Yeah. So he was convicted for a crime that he didn't commit on, on the basis of DNA evidence, which we all think is infallible, but I mean, that's complete nonsense. And uh, has been in prison in California uh, on level four maximum security yards for twelve years, and uh, and as, as the series starts, new new evidence comes to light, and he's and he's released. And so I thought that I thought who would be better at, at, at catching criminals or people that have done bad things than someone that spent twelve years in that environment. So that's kind of, so, yeah, so I'm pretty kind of, I, I, always, I still find that world quite interesting. And also within the California prison system, not quite so much now, but certainly when I did the research, the prisons are all essentially run by the prison gangs. And uh, it's segregated along, very strictly a, along racial lines. So I find all of that fascinating. And yet, if you talk to a lot of people in those gangs, uh, you know, they would identify as not being racist, but that's it's but that's the way they function. That's that's kind of that's the kind of law of being incarcerated in those places that you have to, 
you have to associate with people of your own race. So in a funny way, those, you know, those places are almost a microcosm. And then also what you find is within, within those prisons is that they, although they're incredibly violent, they're not chaotic. Or they can be chaotic, but what I mean by that is they have very, the prisoners have very set rules and codes of conduct that they operate by. Um, so I think, so I think it's good when you're writing a series, you want, you want a series that's going to be entertaining and that you're going to have a, a central character that's going to be interesting and fresh. But also, you know, most crime fiction and most thrillers deal with what's going on in society. So I think all those things, you know, all those, it, it will give me room to explore a lot of things that people are, people are talking about. Okay. That's great. Um, wow. I mean, we've, we've covered a massive oh, wow. amount. Yeah, we've, 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 we've covered a huge amount and I'm sure we could do more. We could probably have you again um, on a, on a, subsequent series of the show I think when you've um, completed this project you come talk about that I think what I'd like to do to sort of close things off really is firstly is there anything that you want to plug at the moment in terms of projects that you want to push out there and then you know is are there any sort of just closing uh, messages or thoughts you want to share for the listeners whether they're you know, people who like to read or whether they're people like myself who are sort of emerging artists and writers? I mean, I don't have anything to plug, really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my main thing is a is, is, is very simple takeaway, which is if you want to be a writer, you have to write. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we've been talking about and, and that's the key to absolutely everything. You have to sit down and you have to find your way of doing that and I think with um, London Writer Salon, you know, what you can extract from that is set yourself, uh, you know, a place and a time every day to sit down and do the work. And even if you only do half an hour a day, that can, that can take you where you, that can take you where you want to go. Okay, brilliant. Well, look, thanks again, David, for um, you know, being so generous with your time. Oh, you're very welcome.